Hello, and we're live. Uh, I'm Rory Roan. Uh, I'm an animator, illustrator, and director. Uh, I work in 3D, primarily using 3D Studio Max. Um, in this session, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then we're going to spend about an hour uh, just making a character from scratch. Um, that's not the amount of time I generally use to make a character, so it might not look exactly like here we go. I think you're, you're seeing my work now, like this kind of fidelity stuff. But we're going to show you some of the basics and sort of show you the loose part of how I work around uh, my wobbly characters. So this is the kind of work I create. I do it for a variety of uh, clients, like like MTV you saw there, uh, and it all kind of sparked from my own personal work. I've been a, an animator and designer for something around 15 years now. Um, and for the first part of my career, I worked uh, in studios, creating what you call third party uh, content. So, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of stuff for um, children's brands and um, creating sort of web content for pre-existing programs. And then about, I'd say nearly four years ago, now I just had a, a kind of a hunger to, um, to create my own self-defined work. And so I started experimenting and um, putting my experimentations up online through Instagram. And that's what you can see uh, playing on the screen now, these sort of short vignettes that I made. I made these, say, 15 second looping animations and kind of fun, playful character designs. And slowly that snowballed. Uh, people start to take interest. Uh, start getting commissioned off the back of it until eventually now I'm in you know the happy position of being able to do that pretty much for for the bulk of my work so um so yeah I think um the main thing that I want people to take away from from my course and this is a little glimpse of, of the sort of thing I show you in my course is that at the heart of of what I do is is kind of leaning into my own hand-drawn sensibility of just kind of making assessment of, of the, the forms that feel instinctual and natural to me and just indulging in the kind of strange, obscure and, and diverse themes that sort of play around my mind and that I can bring into to what I do. Um, that's what I go into in the course in quite some depth. But for today, let's just have a look at a little bit of um, method. So I'm going to give you kind of a very, very encapsulated version of what I do. Usually, the bulk of my design is done by hand on paper. For the purpose of this, I'm going to do it in Photoshop, just so we've got everything in camera. Um, but yeah, let's start. I don't know exactly what this is going to end up being, because this is an experiment. But let's see what we can get to within the hour. Also, please feel free to um, to ask questions throughout. You know, If you've got a quick question, I'll address it now. If you want to know something a little bit more involved around the process of character design or you know anything around animation um, just write it in the comments and then we'll pick it up at the end so yeah to start with i'm here in photoshop and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to just create a character i've turned on the mirror here and i'm just going to draw some basic outlines so i'm going to start with a a nice round form for a head. I like to have kind of big, big ears. So sort of wind that down into a torso and extended neck into body and line there. Some arms that can kind of sit jug like on the side. I like the idea of that. And say three fingers of thumb. And then just a pair of legs sticking at the bottom of here. I quite like to give my characters kind of these curly toed shoes with a nice little stiletto heel. Try and bring that back. Triangular hats for my guys. I like to have these pipe like hats. Simple face. Pill. Eyes. I'm gonna redo that. I don't like the sort of slant I had on that. I'm gonna. There we go. 
So this is a kind of a generic form of, of one of my characters. This process for me of drawing would probably take something in the region of a few hours. And it would just be kind of stream of consciousness drawing, just creating lines, doing other lines again, sort of finding proportions that please me. I've kind of taken that process down now to just moments kind of instinctually because I, you know, I, I do this so often I know intrinsically the kind of forms that that please me um and it's it's usually something like this so in actual fact what i'd do is, is probably spend a good few hours drawing and then end up with something that doesn't look a million miles different from this i'm drawing some lines in there to sort of define what i might do with the the texture of it this is looking a little bit plain so i'm gonna just add a little bit more detail it's looking kind of uh like an old sort of 1960s toy at the moment. I don't tend to um, to colour things until I put them in 3D. I, I've got it in my mind's eye kind of what this will result as. I've got a palette that I like to to play with. But I, um, I'd call that a serviceable character design for our purposes today. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to Copy that, and I'm going to take it into Illustrator. Now, this is my method that's sort of born out of trying to get things out quickly. I think um, when I started doing my solo character design work, you know what I'm doing there, it's just putting on the back layer and um, taking the opacity down. But yeah, when I started doing my sort of solo character design work, I um, it was all about expediency. It's about doing it as quickly as I could. And because it was all extracurricular, it, by day I was doing, you know, my bread and butter work, which was things like medical animation or, um, you know, some sort of web game based on a, on a kid's cartoon series. And then I'd have my evening and probably into the night because I was, I was younger then and more adept at doing things like that um, to experiment with my characters. So. I think I mentioned briefly that my initial stages of, of getting stuff out was to put it across Instagram. And, and a big part of that was to build momentum and have regularity. So part of my style developed through just the need to get it done quickly. And, and that's kind of where my methodology has come from. So, you know, sort of lent into the programs that I that I use best for each individual criteria. And so for, you know, freehand stuff, it's, it's Photoshop. But as I mentioned, I'll probably do that on paper and then photograph my phone and, and bring it in um, as my general working method. And then what I'm about to do here is, is the vector lines. And I find the vector tools in Illustrator uh, much more naturalistic. And it occurred to me that the way in which I structure my characters, vector lines really lend themselves well to, to building forms. And then you can work directly from them and bring them into uh, 3ds max as splines and, and work directly from that so it's a really fast efficient way of building up forms quickly so i'm going to go back into illustrator now and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to take one half of this composition so you can see my purple guideline there i'm just going to pick out key points and part of this as well is that i I'm quite against cleaning up, really, in, in, in my work. I um, I like to make my decisions quickly. I mean, inevitably, things will get cleaned up a little bit, but there's, there's something about the kind of idiosyncratic, quick nature of um, setting proportions and your lines quickly and, and energetically, and then locking that in. And it's kind of like indulging a form of... Um, well, just your naturalistic drawing style, your kind of physicality of, of your drawn work. Letting that live. So what I'm doing here is these are going to be converted into to objects. I'm not going to do the hand because I'll just, I'll define that in 3D. But here for the shoe, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of make a bounding box to set my proportions. And then I'm just going to sort of build out what will become the form of the shoe. So I'm going to make a line there, pull out one end, do that, and then offset that a little bit. 
this doesn't already make sense or make sense um, once we get into 3D Studio Max. So yeah, I'm making one half of everything. And then it's going to put in a couple of more um, like some guide proportions here, just to kind of I'm not going to bring the actual picture in. So I just want to remind myself what my intention of the thicknesses of these elements were. So bring that bit to line here. Same here. That was cheap there. Just making these curves. So that's a good approximation. I'm going to smooth that off a little bit there. I'm actually changing my mind a little bit. I don't quite like the form of that. So I'm going to fatten out a little bit. Ears. Super simple. I don't uh, lavish a lot of attention on my ears. That. To me, it's an absolutely adequate form of an ear. There's another point, so I'm just going to break up that path and then move that in. And then face, I'm just going to take the lips actually. And then everything else I'm going to define in three dimensions. I'll see if we've had any uh, questions yet, but if we've got any quick question, I'll go through something as I'm working. So yeah, that seems like a good enough start. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that back layer out. So we're just left with that half. And I'm going to save it. And I'm going to save it as version two, because I did do a little practice earlier today. And I'm going to go back and save it as an old copy, Illustrator 3, which strips out basically all the data that 3ds Max can't interpret. So bring it into 3D Studio Max. I'm going to import that. Put my version two there. And I want to merge it with the scene, and I want to bring it in as multiple objects. Okay, so then I'll bring it through, lying flat. So I think that's come through a little bit small. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to increase the size of that. And oops, I'm going to go to a reset X form so that everything is at true scale. Convert to spline. So I've got that all as one set piece. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my snapping tools. I'm going to put that to 2.5 and make sure it's snapped to vertex. I'm going to take my pivots. I'm just going to snap them to central points, that's the only one that's really applicable to. And then that'll define my point where I wrap around to create a uh, lathe. And there we go, very quickly, I've got the principal shape for my character there. I'm gonna increase the uh, segments to, I'd say 32 for now. And then I'm gonna go to uh, make that into an edit poly. That's one of the things I really like about Future Studio Max is this non-destructive workflow. You know, I try and, in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna duplicate that so I've got something to go back to if uh, things go wrong. I'm gonna take my snap off to do that because I wanna keep it within the same, uh, uh, same area on the screen. I'm going to rotate that 90 degrees as well, so we're upright. Okay. 
now. Let's my character. So the arm I'm going to create. At this point, you can probably hear my daughter having her dinner in the next room. I would apologise, but that's going to happen throughout the entirety of this hour. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to set the interpolation to adaptive. So we've got a smooth arm. And then just increase the thickness until we're matching with our original intention. And then alter a little bit to bring it back into the form. What a lot of my time goes into, which is something I'm not going to be touching on so much in this hour, is just merging everything so that we've got a sort of nice through line from this body into this arm. So we are just going to have objects kind of butted up against one another, which is something I sort of work to avoid. I do go into depth. Uh, in my course, uh, which is available now, and you can uh, start using from the 1st of March, exclusively through Domestica. Um, there we go, so that's, that's a leg. I'm setting those to about 32 in the round. Now I have the forms that are going to make the shoe. So again, with my snap on, I'm going to define the pivot point. And going to lay that. And I'm just going to check quickly that. Yeah, that's fine. Sometimes what it does is it sort of flips so that the outer edge becomes the inner edge. And you can, um, you can flip your normals quite quickly to, to deal with that. You also want to have the weld core on. I'm going to check that that was done previously. So put my weld core on. And a good thing about this lathe uh, process as well is that you can generate mapping coordinates uh, to help with your UV. So when you want to texture them later, um, that gives you a good starting point to have a nice flattened out texture map. So back to this shoe, I'm going to set the pivot point to the top now, top center. And I'm going to apply a bend. I switched screens to my smaller screen, which is why you see the menus coming up at a funny angle uh, each time. There you go. That's a very, very quick, basic approximation of that shoe scale before that shoe. And I'm going to go back to my poly and make sure that I've got adaptive on so that we can have a nice smooth finish on that. I'm going to make the heel. There we go. Let's move that in. So what I do a lot of the times, these all become, you know, this will be my first pass at making the forms I want. And then, you know, you can consider the design done at this stage and it will give you quite a good indication of what it's going to look like. But then to make it functional, to use in my animations, the rest of the time will go into using this as the basis to, you know, re-topologize and, and make a more robust character, sort of breaking up the um, the structure so you don't have so many lines that sort of close to each other. Or if an arm needs to fold, you want to make sure that, you know, the quads are equidistant and um, can fold nicely and everything. But for the purpose of fleshing out and blocking out and getting, you know, an illustration, if this was just a character purely for the function of illustration, comes here. Um, then you know that would um, this would be serviceable for that. So here's my ear, and this one I'm just going to she make that renderable and just push that out and there we go. That is an ear with a little ear hole in the middle. So a character's looking, you know, not too unlike my characters generally do. 
Um, I'm going to build a quick hand now. Uh, this is one of the more involved processes, but it's um, here's, here's my speed hand. So create a line. And I'm going to put a quad cap on. I'm going to give it about five segments. I'm going to bring the width down. Just my left view. I'm going to take the end of that. I'm going to make sure it is a bezier corner. I'm just going to twist it a bit. A bit more. Okay, that feels good. And then I'm going to make two instances of that. I'm also speeding through this. What I generally do is name everything as I go uh, with you know solid conventions. So this would be you know quick character one finger left hand what you know well you know you get a naming convention but you know I'd, I'd make sure I'd sort of rigidly stick to that because you can be lazy and not do it and then really hate yourself later when you've got to navigate what has now become you know a huge project file uh, okay so so you can probably tell what I'm doing there it's three fingers and a thumb. Let's have a look at that. That's it, you. What I do on these instances is, yeah, set that to 12 sides. And then this one, which I didn't make an instance, I can set that to about 16. And then I'm going to take that middle finger and I'm going to convert it to poly. And I'm going to attach these two and then delete the top run. And then take out further four on each side. In fact, we don't need that either. So. Now, if anything in this course that or this our session is going to go wrong, it's it, it will be this because I frequently forget the kind of the numbers that I've set myself. But I basically what I want this to do is I want to create these fingers and conform them to match a you know thirty two point cylinder at the top of the arm, so everything sort of gels well. Uh, I'm going to go in here, I'm going to connect, and I'm going to do two. And then, tell you what, actually, no, I skipped a step, step there. What I'm going to do first is grab these sections here and connect them up. Bridge those. And the same here as well. So, actually, a more efficient way to do that. Select that and then select edge with control to deselect these two. And then bridge those. And then grab that, make it into a ring, and do my two connect through that. And same here. And then what I'll do is I'm going to borrow a part of this. So I'm just going to clone that as a copy. I'm going to convert it to a poly. Select this row, delete. And then take the disconnected part that I don't want anymore. 
I should just be left with a cap on the end. And I'm going to isolate that selection. Okay, we're not in line. Uh, so I'll bring that into line. So yeah, obviously I've been creating everything at point zero there. So that will do. Because I'm doing this at speed, precision is kind of going out. I'm, I'm you know, I'm rushing decisions here. Okay, so I've got a question. Any specific reason 3DS Max is your 3D application of choice? Have you ever messed around with something like Cinema 4D or Blender? A little bit. I've played with um, Cinema 4D a little bit. The, the, you know, I think at the core of it is because it's, it's the one that came first for me. When I started using 3D at all, it was as a, um, it was a problem solving device, really. I was um, principally um, a 2D animator for years. And then there's like one or two projects where there was an object that, um, that just worked a lot better with 3D. And the studio that I was working at had 3D Studio Max available. That was their, their product of choice. And so I kind of fell in uh, with that. But since then, I've just, it's kind of, yeah, I think you just, your, your brain melds with you know, when I've got quite a um, idiosyncratic way of working things out, I think, or I've been told. Um, and so once I knew the framework, you know, I started playing with that more and more. And, and it's now, it's, it's, it's a really long way, -winded way of saying it's the tool I know. Um, you know, there are things within, I've looked at um, Blender a bit more recently. I think Blender's really good, it's, it's for porting to other applications. So, you know, I, I have had to use it to um, prepare things to, for, you know, to go into um, to web applications and things like that. Um, and um, I'm really interested in looking at the sculpting tools within that as well. I know that a lot of people use Cinema 4D for the type of work I do. And I think that's because, you know, that, that seemed to be the model for it early on with its, you know, better use of, um, better but easily navigatable sort of physics-based rendering engines and so on and you can just get a much more glossy um sort of motion graphics you look a lot quicker for one thing i really like about um 3 studio max is the non-destructive workflows like i love the stack on the the right hand side here and i just i kind of that's where a lot of my um animation play comes from you know i get ideas from that and um so yeah, I guess the application does kind of, you know, I, I think in terms of the capabilities of, of the program as well, and you know, through that, my capabilities, and it, it shapes um, some of the decisions I make in my animations. Is that rambly enough for you? I think hopefully that's <laughs> somewhat of an answer. So what I've done as I've been chatting through that is I, I took the cap of that arm and I connected it up with these fingers. Uh, and so now I've got a sort of sloping form here. And then what I've done here is I've just taken out a block on the side there. And that's a block of four sides per piece. And so 8, 8, 16. Hence this thumb having 16 sides. And what I'm going to do is just delete the end off of that. Uh, oh, left a little tip there. And then I'm going to take the main form, attach that. And then I'm just going to take those and bridge and so look then and then I'm just going to relax that a bit there we go and that is a hand Could probably do it being a little bit smaller. I'm just going to center the pivot. In fact, what I'll do is I'm just going to turn my snap on. I'm going to take the pivot point to around center there and then shrink it down and ooh, take it off and mess it up. If we've got any more questions, I'll be happy to, to um, take some. 
How do you get the jiggly physics in your animations? Are the movements hand keyed or is some of it kind of plug in that does it automatically? Um, a lot of it is making rigs specifically to get that jiggly motion in. And then some of it is um, physics based. It's not a plug in. I tend to use the, um, the particle generator. Um, and I do soft body dynamics uh, using the particle generator. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll generally make like a really sort of basic principle form. And then I'll um, sort of map a more complex form onto that one. So the basic form will take on the, the sort of impact points that will give a nice sort of squidge. And then I will, um, yeah, wrap one of my more sort of complex character molds around that, which will then take on the sort of squidge of that character. Um, and then I use caching to sort of store a, a low data version of, of those um, animations. And you can sort of speed it up, slow it down, and make big group sets of things moving through space um, and use collisions and everything. So it's a real mixture. I'd say the bulk of it is hand keyed. I really do enjoy kind of losing myself in the process of um, just making things feel sort of really tangible and, and making sure that sort of that resting point is sort of probably not realistic, but feasible within the um, the context of the animation. Okay, so in my model now, what I'm going to do is just going to take the, the foot down so it's lower than the hand, just for ease of my character moving around, and then I'm going to bring the leg down there. And then I'm going to take these, and I'm going to clone them. and mirror. As with the sort of the caveat I keep on giving on this one, I would be more particular about this if I weren't trying to build this character as, as quick as I could. So, you know, I'd sort of make sure that I wouldn't approximately place it on the other side. I'd make sure it was positioned in exactly the right area. Uh, same with this ear. So what I'm gonna do now is Here's my mouth. One thing I like to do is I'm going to bring that forward. And I'm going to make that into a rectangular mouth. And then I'm going to convert it. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I think it's going off the screen, excuse me. Right, I'm going to convert it to uh, editable poly. And then select the front, invert the selection, so then we've only got this front section. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my freeform mode. I'm going to go to surface, select draw on, select this mesh, and I'm going to open up my conform tool. Uh, let's see. And where are my tools? So that's embarrassing because I'm using a different screen. As I keep saying, it's um, it's not giving me my um, drop down unless I'm not finding it. So while I sort that out, does someone want to ask another question? How do you create two D style faces in three D? Um, I do that by using just kind of flat vectors so like just drawing over them uh like you you know like you you would if you were just graffitiing on something or i do them in texture so you know you can draw them in photoshop or whatever and then uh uh just apply that to the texture and then give a little bit of relief through a bump map uh okay so what i'm doing now doesn't work exactly the way I want because I, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty here with what I'll show on my screen. But what I've done is I've just I've flattened that into an object. I'm now conforming it to the form of the face, which this is, I guess, a bit of an answer to, to the question I just got asked. Uh, and I'm going to create a swift loop around the center of it. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract that loop I just made, and I'm going to create a shape out of it. I'm going to do that smooth. And I'm going to delete the one I just made. And so now, if I take that back to radial, I've got a form that's um, conformed to the shape of my head. That's a fast way of doing that. So then I'm just going to make a couple of quick features. How are we doing for time? We're doing all right. Okay, so. So how's this character doing? Yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a million miles away from the sort of nonsense that I generally create. These could be a bit smoother, but, you know, we'll tweak that. So I'm just going to do some very simple dots for eyes, I think, for this one. So yeah, I'm just gonna make some. So I'm gonna make some circles, some spheres rather. Have we got any more questions? When working on a team on projects like, when working on it, like, how do you get your ideas, Nexus? Do you do the modeling as well? Uh, what's the workflow? Or are you teaching the other artists how to be you? I guess there's an element of that. Um, but no, I, I, what I do is I, there, there's a different set of, um, there's a different pipeline in place for when you create something on your own. So like my methodology is very idiosyncratic and it works for me generating content for myself to put online. And this wouldn't really be compatible with a uh, full fledged you know, studio model, you need to make concessions to other artists and other ways of working um, that, um, you know, this this wouldn't really work you. But what I do do is because a lot of it is based around my, my look and feel, is that I'll create a, an approximation. So it, it's a really good shortcut as opposed to kind of like having to draw, you know, front and sides and say, imagine this in 3D to someone you can literally just create the, the basis of it and get the scales and ratios you want. And it's just, you know, it, it's clarity of vision is, is the main thing first and foremost. So, I mean, you know, you just, um, you work to be as clear as you can. Um, and if the clear thing is creating a 3D model, that's what it is, or if it would be better expressed uh, through really detailed line drawing, then, then you do that. Um, so, no, I don't really do the modeling, but I do the modeling as a sample. Uh, so what I'm doing here is just creating a really basic form for the eye. Um, so I'll put a slice on there, and then I'm inserting another sphere within that. And I'll probably just take those two, put an FFD in, and I'm going to squish that. Let's have a look. Is that ugly? It's a little bit ugly, but that's fine. Okay, so. Take that there. From the front, just kind of get a basic alignment. Is that where I want them? That's fine. Right, that's because I'm within the object, so I was wondering why it wasn't snapping them. Okay. Right. 
Um, yeah, any more questions? Do you think I still follow along with your course if I'm not in a specific 3D program? Uh, no. <laughs> I wouldn't advise it. It's If you're using um, Cinema 4D, I think all of my processes are specific to the functions of, um, of 3D Studio Max. So I would have some familiarity with 3D Studio Max um, to start with. Um, yeah. I mean, the first part of my course is about um, ideation, really. So I, I talk a lot about where I get my inspiration. I sort of take you through the drawing process and how I find it um, really valuable to spend a lot of time getting to know what you'd instinctively do on a page. So I'll show you when while I'm on camera, I'll show you what one of my sketchbook pages looks like. Just spending a long time. Just drawing and drawing and not being careful. That's kind of, I think that's how you get to the point where you can just be comfortable with doing like quite, you know, minimalistic work. Um, I'm just looking for a, a good page to show you. There we go. So that's the, that's the sort of thing. So I, you know, I just do reams and reams and reams of these things and just, it's all about finding you know, the unique line work that I like that my hand has done. I think that's one thing that I'm sort of conscious of is, you know, when I show these things to people, it's obviously I'm not advocating this is what sort of artwork, this is what my artwork looked like. You know, it's um, it's it's not an invitation to say, you know, draw these blobby characters. It's, it's to sort of take these idiosyncratic, you know, idiosyncratic nature of, of you and, and put that down to the page. And so I just happen to think in sort of silly little triangle, hatted, blobby, you know, genderless little forms. Um, for you, it should probably be something quite different. And uh, and I think it for me, it took a long time to find that. So it's the value of um, just, you know, pursuing that uh, and drawing and drawing and drawing until you find what what feels, what feels right. It's not what you asked. <laughs> what a rambling um, answer. Have you any advice on getting your work noticed on Instagram? I feel like with the algorithm and so many artists posting daily, it's almost impossible. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I had I had a um, Instagram account for you know years before um, before it did anything. And I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing here quickly. Is I've done these two eyes. Yeah, so these lids with a sort of an eyeball in the middle of it. Uh, and then over that, I've made this plane. And what I'm doing now is I'm just taking these forms and I'm putting a, uh, a skin wrap on. I'm going to add that plane and then say wait all points. And then it's the same process of, of conforming. So I'm going to take that plane now, break out into a um, editable poly so that I can contort it. And then I'm going to go to conform. I'm going to move that a bit closer to the head. So it. So yeah. So because I want um, I want these eyes to wrap to the to the shape of the head. So yeah, about the um, the Instagram thing the thing that solved it for me was was regularity really like my first um venture into this kind of style was doing these animations and i i made a schedule for myself which was that i would um you know make pieces that i was sure i could complete i'm just gonna turn it to poly uh that i was sure i could complete within a designated period so like a week uh and you know just be sure that i could um finish that piece by then and then i would post every saturday my logic being at that time is that just people were around on saturday and sunday so if i posted something early in the morning uh on a saturday that would give people who had free time over the weekend to, to click and it would build a you know it would build up and 
beat the algorithm or you know, work with the algorithm. From what I understand, I think the algorithm has, has got tougher. Um, but it's, it's regularity, and it's just making sure that you have something that people want to see, I think. I mean, that was a big thing about making my work self-contained. You know, it doesn't require any other context, and it and it's people love a loop, you know. And there's a three-act structure distilled into that as well. You know, there's if, if you watch them with that in mind, you'll see there's a sort of setup. So, like, often the physicality of the characters is set up. Like, oh, that's an unusual character or a usual structure. What's it going to do? Then it reveals what it's going to do, and that might be a dance or it might be some sort of exotic movement. And then there'll be a sort of punchline, unexpected result, and then reform and go back to the beginning, which means people rewatch it as well. So it's, I think it's just kind of be brutal with yourself and, and kind of um, look at it from an outside perspective and think, if, if I didn't have this personal connection to my work, and obviously I love it because I have laboured over it, what is it, what is there for, for someone else to enjoy as well? Don't make work for the algorithm it's going to suck all the enjoyment and life out of what you do but just think like what is the the value that makes this a shareable thing i think underpins it and just keep it regular that's um i think if, if you do those things and it's a you know works of a, of a standard it will it will find its audience so i've applied those eyes to this head and we're we're coming up to the hour now so what i'm going to quickly do i'm going to flatten this down i'm just going to break these out into different um, different elements. So I'm going to take the hat, I'm going to attach it. And then, yeah, that's fine. And then same with the head. And let's see if I do it by angle. There we go. And attach that as well. And then his little that. So they're all separate objects now. And I'm going to texture this super, super quick. So what I'm going to do is open up my texture console here. I'm going to use physical materials. And I'm just going to some colors quite quickly so i like a nice pink and i'm going to go the other end of the spectrum and have this sort of turquoisey blue and then let's say it's kind of purpley color yeah I'm going to set my reference to about 0.65. The idea would have been to sort of set these, they're all going to be universal, set these parameters before duplicating material. Uh, and then maybe just some. I'm going to make his eyes pitch black and relatively shiny. So going through, I'm going to texture this. Lips. That's quite an ugly character. That is creepy by my standards, I'd say. But, you know, my main objective was to make something that exists, and I would say it does. So. All right, this is quite repetitive motion, so I can take another question while I'm doing this. Here we go. Do you always recreate 3D neutral pose, even initial sketch is an action pose? Um, 
Yeah, I do actually. I always think in neutral pose. Um, yeah. And then it kind of, um, and then I might sort of T pose out that afterwards. Um, but no, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, one of the good things about doing it this way is that if you're doing it with splines, I mean, if you want to repose a character, that's really quick to do like that. So, um, yeah. I do. Do your characters use a similar rig for all of them, or do you make a new rig from scratch each time? Um, pretty much a new rig each time, really, because a lot of my characters, I mean, this one's just sort of a straight up, uh, you know, two arms, two legs, straight on character. What I would, um, one second. yeah, uh, a lot of my characters are, are just these, you know, big constructions that sort of move in, in mechanical ways and the rig will be really spoke. So I would, um, yeah, I'd make something unique for that. What I've just done, uh, as I was talking, was just imported something I made previously, which is just a kind of a very standardized lighting set uh, made to mimic studio lighting and an infinity curve. I'm just dropping that in. And I'm going to frame it just straight on. And then we got Okay, so I've got Arnold selected. And I'm going to render that out to 180 squared, that'll be fine. And then I'm just going to quickly go to my exposure control. I'm going to set that to physical camera active. And let's see. There we go. That is an ugly, creepy little character. So, I think we can be wrapping up fairly soon, but yeah, let's do some more involved questions now. If if anyone has anything they, they want to ask, and we can we can cut back to my funny, ugly little character a little bit if we want to as well. But I hope that was um, interesting at least. That's kind of a, a very sort of potted, super fast, super clumsy way that I would um, go through making my character. I mean, it's it's you know it's it's a, a character. It's a method that, that was born out of sort of convenience and, and um, sort of, I guess, uniquely the way in which I problem solve and the tools that I was already familiar with in my workflows through kind of being a, a 2D artist initially. Um, and then it's just kind of, it's come from there. But I mean, a great pleasure for me in, in my 3D work is, my personal work is the fact that it is personal work and um, can get lost in it. So that's kind of how I've developed my my workflow is just kind of pushing things until they break, experimenting, seeing what does what, what you know suits my sensibilities. Am I better at kind of creating forms in vector as opposed to blocking that in three D? You know, other people's minds work in different ways, so it's just all around experimentation. Where do I find inspiration? Um, I think everywhere. I think that the principal thing that I find inspiration from is is the mixing of ideas. It's bringing together things that don't naturally fit one another. So things from completely different worlds, like, um, you know, I, I really like um, exotic birds. You know, a lot of the stuff I've got behind here is, is just uh, reference books about um, nature and, um, and the landscape and maybe folk ritual. And it's just kind of, I think that, the thing that's more pertinent to me around inspiration as opposed to kind of like, where do you find it is what do you do with it? You know, uh, do, do you build 
processes around it. It's kind of, you know, it's it's never inspiration has never felt like a, a eureka thing to me. It's just it's about just having your head constantly loading up and find a, a system to you know dedicate the time to just kind of just looking through things that could be inspirational, letting those things coalesce, and then just letting your your subconscious get you know absorb all of these different stimuli and then in your you know in your in your downtime in your sort of restful moments things will coalesce because you're primed for it i think it's um and drawing endlessly drawing i think that's the thing if, if you might have these ideas but what do they coalesce into if you're not just kind of experimenting i i, I found the most valuable thing with my drawing is to not care which sounds um flippant but it's just to you know, I, I don't draw for precision. I draw to to explore and to find mistakes and and to not be precious. So, just looking a lot of nonsense and and you know, conquering the fear of the blank page is, is kind of where I find inspiration. Your work is kick ass and super insane. Thank you very much. Is there much of a commercial market for this kind of art? I hope so. Because I haven't got any other ideas. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's good to end on a terrifying question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, there is actually loads. So I'm doing very well. It's, um, yeah. Thoughts on new NFT crypto art stuff happening? Good. I think it's good. Yeah, I haven't looked too much into it. Um, kind of had a few conversations around last year about it without the full understanding of what it was uh and now i know what it is i think it's great in terms of um in principle you know when i put out a um say like a gif I mean, it's not really a gif because it's you know it's got a bit more fidelity than that but for want of a better word a gif onto onto instagram you know the value it has for me there is is to to gain more exposure and to to you know tempt those um, commercial projects. Um, but it'd be great to, if that itself had a monetary value. I like the idea that sort of digital arts uh, get afforded the opportunity that traditional arts always have of, you know, of it actually, there being a unique piece of it. I think it's, I think it's, it's great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, that's something I'm really keen to explore. Um, I want to know a bit more about it. Is your rigging process also pretty quick? Um, no, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, it, it's kind of equally um, trial and error, but uh, no, I spend quite a long time. I what, what I, my general rule of thumb when I'm making a rig is I'll, I'll make a rig bespoke to the specific animation that I want to do. So like, if you look through my back catalog, you'll see there's kind of ones with concentric bowls wobbling around, you know, I'll, I'll have rigged that to do specifically that motion. So, for example, you couldn't take the rig I make and then go and do a completely different animation with it. It would be made, you know, to facilitate that purpose. And because I'm making it specifically that purpose, I break it down as much as I can. So, you know, I've, I've got different kind of controllers for primary and secondary motion. And it's just a kind of um, an exercise in defining the logic of that. So I spend quite a lot of time just sort of testing and um can I break that down further? Can I simplify the individual bits of animation I need to do with any one part? And so, you know, I kind of, because I'm working on my own for these things as well, you know, I am, the rigging process will sometimes also be the animation process. You know, it, it completely, it can completely turn on its head if it's just you that you're, you're working with. If you're working with a team, then you've got to have a little bit of respect for other people in terms of not doing something completely mad and, and alien that they won't know what to do with. How do you make different characters unique but connected? Um, I think that's just by virtue of it coming from the same brain, really. I think it's, you know, I've got a natural way of drawing things and, um, and that's what under underpins my work. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just the fact that they're all sort of rooted in my hand drawn style. So I think, you know, if, if anyone attempts to do that, if you sort of naturally lean into to what the, you know, the hallmarks of your the physicality of like kind of your mark making is 
inevitably those things are going to feel connected. I think that will that's us for today. So um, I hope this has been interesting. And um, like I say, you can see this process and a lot more in depth workings on, on the course that I've uh, that is available now, but you'll be able to do from March 1st. So thank you very much for, for joining me if you made it this far. Cheers. <laughs> I'm going to show you some examples. This is what we've got behind me. ¿Qué más preguntas tengo por aquí? ¿Cómo descubriste que lo tuviste?